course, we're going to start with someone who is on the streets today, someone who's been organising the demonstrations that we've seen with Fridays for Future, and not just that, in many other ways uh, as well. Uh, I'm going to now introduce to you, from the demonstration, Paul McHale. There's a slight disclaimer that at 3 o'clock this morning I was finalising our speaker programme. So anything that comes out of my mouth, it, 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 I'm frazzled. That's, that's, that's the long and short of it. I'll also take this opportunity to put to bed a press rumour which got started this morning when one of our activists did an interview. And she was asked what our security contract was with GMB, who were providing security for our march, apparently. Chris and Sean and everyone were apparently providing security in the eyes of the press. But that's not true. Chris did ask me when he came up to do a speech, by the way, if I thought it would be advisable that he threw himself into the crowd when he finished. So I, I talked him down, I talked him down, he didn't. I'm not entirely sure the press would have caught him. Um, no, so we were asked, we were asked a lot when we were in the run up to organising these kinds of things, whether we're hopeful for things like COP. I think the fact that we are asked whether we're hopeful for things like COP shows just how far we still have to turn the dial on climate change. Yeah, that we're even asked these questions shows that. I mean, of course we're not hopeful for a positive outcome from COP, because locally and internationally, COP failed before it even began. As a result of a consciously cruel vaccine apartheid perpetuated by this country and blocking the trips waiver, this is the most exclusionary COP that we've ever had. So internationally, we failed, but locally, we failed. Look at the fact that we magicked up an integrated transport card that we've been asking for for years. By the way, it's ridiculously embarrassing because a lot of our guys have half these cards, they're delegates. So they get on the subway and they're just able to walk straight on to get their cards, and there I'm with the machine tapping in my details to get my card. It's embarrassing, but there's, there, we failed before we even began. That there's even a discussion that COP might save the planet shows how far we have to go in realising the real causes of climate change. It's impossible that COP could ever save the planet or avert the threat of climate catastrophe. Because the world leaders, the corporations and the institutions are those who caused it. Those who are in the SEC just now, they're the people that caused the climate crisis. I mean, on Wednesday, for goodness sake, the NYT Climate Hub platform, the vice chair of BlackRock. I mean, if that doesn't tell you how far we still have to go, I don't know what will. Lots of folk will tell you that the failure of COP shows that our system is broken, that capitalism is failing. Capitalism is working exactly by design. It's working by the system. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to. The logic of capitalism will always bring about climate catastrophe. And it's incredibly important that we remember that because on a planet of finite resources, when a system is characterized by extraction, when a system is characterized by exploitation and the gross mass accumulation of wealth, it will always accelerate global warming. It will always risk extinction because that's the logical conclusion of mass extraction. I'll talk a bit now about, about Fridays for Future and the youth climate movement because it's worth doing. Because when I first got involved, I, I was I was sceptical of the climate movement. I think a lot of people still are, and sometimes rightfully, because there's there's the idea that a lot of young guys getting together can be a bit of a gimmick sometimes. And and I was worried about that when I first got involved, and I was very conscious of it. But I've been entirely dissuaded because I realised that. FFF and climate strikes across the country mobilised incredible amounts of young people to the streets. I mean, today we brought tens of thousands of people to the streets behind a banner which read that People United will never be defeated. <laughs> Any movement which has the capability to do that and bring together the broad coalition in the way that we did today is worthy of our solidarity. And when I realised that, I got much, much more involved. I think what FFF and the climate movement does, or has done for my generation, is similar to what the referendum did in 2014, 
where we saw mass growth and consciousness and math, mass growth, 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 and they go slow my words, and it's, that's because I've been up for too long. <laughs> um, yeah, the consciousness of the referendum bill has been mirrored in the consciousness the FFF has built. So it's been responsible for a mass growth in education and political consciousness amongst young people. It's been responsible for a huge increase in the awareness of the inhumanity of capitalism, the crushing realities of historical and neo-colonial extraction. And more people know that, more young people know about that as a result of the climate movement, even if they're just joining in chants which talk about system change. That's a huge achievement. And don't doubt that from those chants, people go and they read and they learn. And that's, that's what really drives the climate movement. It also plays an incredibly important role just now, because as war is waged on young people, both from Tory governments at Westminster and in a concocted culture war designed purely to polarise us and divide us, FFF and the climate movement stands at the heart of that, but stands united and together rather than giving in to those ridiculous, ridiculous wars. Um, our strike today, then, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that, because, because it's worth talking about. Because as soon as we saw workers mobilising, and it looked like there were going to be strikes ahead of COP, we realised that we had to get our act together, and we had to stand in solidarity and organise something which properly linked the climate movement and the labour movement. Because we're fighting the same thing, whether it's the exploitation of labour or the exploitation of finite resources, we are united in our enemy and in our opponent. So, we spoke to the guys at GMB and we organised something special. I think today, I, was, I, think, I am still incredibly proud of the coalition that we brought together today. Um, we took some of our international activists down to the depot uh, yesterday, <laughs> which was an interesting experience. Um, so the Swedes turned up uh, and, and were down there and they got the van right because they're hungry. Because admittedly, it's eight in the morning, they've not had their breakfast yet. They go to the van, and they're all vegetarian, right? Because the climate activists and vegetarians and those hungry. Mm -hmm. I'm not veggie, I should say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't talk, don't talk, don't talk, that's not the word. And then um, these guys got the van and um, asked for a vegetarian option, and all they're offered is a Thai scone. So once I've explained, <laughs> once I've explained to them what a Thai scone was, they were then asked what sauce they would like. <laughs> and this poor guy, Anton, I'll never let him forget this, asked for garlic sauce. <laughs> and then there was, a whole, there was a whole other situation where they asked for a cappuccino, and we're told that. Because you could only have black coffee. It was, it was quite an experience. But that's the solidarity that we have created, bringing Austrians, Germans, people from the most affected areas by climate change to the picket lines. And that's something that yeah, we're, all, we're all really proud of. Because isolating our struggles only puts us at a disadvantage. Uniting our struggles against exploitation is the only way that we ever stand any chance of winning winning a better world. And making solidarity more than a slogan showing up is the most important part of that. Lynn mentioned before, and Brian as well, that COP has taken place on the banks of the Clyde. Today, well, I mean, historically, um, industrial heartland and all of that. Today, our march concluded at George Square, where 100 years ago, uh, the British establishment deployed tanks, of course, um, in response to what was called by the Scottish Secretary of Bolshevist Uprising. Um, today, we're fighting the same thing that they were in the days of Red Flag side when they fought for a 40 hour week. And the same solidarity which brought people onto the streets then brought people onto the streets today, or at least I like to hope so. Um, we will win our fight for a radical just transition that doesn't leave anybody behind and which beats capitalism because we don't have a choice, because we don't win, we don't have anything else. Um, today and tonight, um, I have immense hope, and it's a reminder of that immense hope. So thank you very much for coming today, if you did, and thanks for having me tonight.